Um, thank you all for coming to this session. It promises to be a cracker. We have three absolutely marvelous speakers who I'll introduce now. They'll speak. Um, first two will speak for about 10 minutes, and then um, and, and Dan Nolan, who I'll introduce in a second, would like to talk you through very, very specifically what to do to avoid state surveillance and, and keep your own privacy. So, so um, yeah, you'll come, away, you'll come away intellectually enthused, but also the government won't know. Um, so the first speaker uh, is Darcy Allen. Darcy is a colleague of mine at the Institute of Public Affairs. He's also a PhD candidate at RMIT. He works um, uh, at the IPA on the interrelationship between regulation and emerging in industries, so things like um, sharing economy and Uber and Airbnb and that sort of thing. And at RMIT, his PhD is on um, the Innovation Commons as an evolving institutional solution to an innovation problem, which um, you'll have to ask him about. Um, the, our second speaker, Stefan Levera, is a, um, a graduate of the University of New South Wales. He works as a corporate internal auditor at an ASX listed in construction materials company. More importantly, he has a um, very good blog, libertarian blog, um, peaceandmarkets.com, which I all recommend you pick up. He's a um, expert and enthusiast on things like Bitcoin and spoken um, at a number of Bitcoin conferences and, and so forth. And he, in the little bio he sent me, he takes credit for making Dan Nolan a libertarian. Yep. He was, <laughs> he was, as I read, <laughs> the person to actually convert Dan to anarcho-capitalism back in the day on BOS.org. <laughs> so there you are. Uh, so that's really special uh, for Stefan and Dan. Um, <laughs> So Dan, Dan, has made, Dan Nolan has made a name for himself as a prominent internet, internet activist and entrepreneur who received national prominence for his Paul Keating insult generator app, his <laughs> Stop Tony Meow Facebook app, which as I understand um, replaces all pictures of Tony Abbott on your internet browser with pictures of cats. <laughs> so he's a troll. Let's be, let's be very specific about this. Um, Australia's most famous troll. Uh, but more importantly, it was most recently in the spotlight when um, Senator Scott Ludlam quoted at length from his guide to avoiding state surveillance, which I'm sure he'll give us a little bit of a potted summary. Now I'd like to introduce Darcy to talk about regulation and technology. Thank you. Thank you very Good morning everyone. So as you can see, we're going to keep it pretty casual for this session. Uh, none of us have any slides, we're just kind of going to talk a little bit, put a few notes. So what has brought me here is I work at the IPA and I recently wrote a report on the sharing economy with Chris Berg. And I'm briefly going to introduce the sharing economy for those who don't know what it is. But what I'm talking about is Uber and Airbnb and all of these new suite of business models. And the one thing that all of these business models do is they help us access the excess capacity and the resources that we already own. Okay, these are markets. They're markets on every indicator that you can possibly find. They're just better markets than we've seen before, and they're just a little bit weird in a couple of different ways. The thing that's fundamentally started this is technology. What technology's done is it's made information, it's made information really cheap, uh, and it's made it really easy to get. It's information that we could never have before. Uh, in the example of Uber, that's the information that you can look on your phone right now and you can see if there is a spare car seat around the corner. That car was always there, okay? The thing is, is that we just have better information to access that. So that's the first thing I want to get across. This, this is what the sharing economy, it's, it's just different markets, okay? And we're in favour of markets and I'm not going to go on about how good markets are. That's, that's not what I'm going to talk about today. So. What we're really talking about when we're regulating new technologies is we're talking about the institutional environment that we want to put that technology in. Okay, so we're saying, what sort of rules do we want to put around that technology to determine who can use it, when they can use it, if they can use it in the CBD area, or if they can't, all of these different rules. And what we've got is we've got a spectrum. At one end, we've got dictatorship, right, where you specifically determine what a technology is for. At the other end, we've got disorder. And I don't particularly like the name disorder. There's a lot of order at that end of the spectrum. Uh, but you've got this whole range along the way. 
Okay, so at one end you've got highly prescriptive rules, and at the other end you don't. So there's an obvious moral case for being at the disorder end of this spectrum when we're regulating new technologies. And that case is I want to buy a 3D printer with Bitcoin and print a drone and fly it around. That, that's the sort of thing, that, that's the moral case, and I want to do it because I'm allowed to do that. But there's a, strong, there's a strong economic case as well. And the economic case is that pretty much the history of technologies has been we create something and it's pretty good at whatever we create it for. But <coughs> what is more important is the market opportunities that come later when we go, oh wait, lasers aren't for this particular purpose. We can actually read CDs with it as well and we can do this and now in your office you've probably got 50 lasers in all this all over your office. So, the important thing is, is that we need rules that aren't prescriptive so that we can find the market opportunities for the technologies we develop. So aside from the moral case that this is a technology and I should have it and I should have the right to have it, there's a very strong economic case for that as well. The second point that I want to make is that everyone talks about, and this is another separate thing, is that everyone talks about the sharing economy and Uber as tech entrepreneurs. Okay? They're technological entrepreneurs. Yes, they are. But what I find most exciting about the sharing economy, and Uber in particular, is that they're actually political entrepreneurs. And they're undertaking political entrepreneurship in a way that we have never seen before. And this is one of the most exciting things that we've got in the relationship between technology and liberty that I have ever seen. So, back in 1971, George Digler won a Nobel Prize, well he won it later, um, and what he said is that some industries, they want to, they demand, there's a demand for regulation. Industries want rules put on them. Because what rules mean is you have barriers to entry around your technology. Okay? Industry want rules. And what that means is they get super normal profits on the inside of that industry. So that's one side of it. Five years later, another economist came along, Sam Peltzman, and he said, wait, but regulators, they actually want to regulate as well because they get benefits from regulating. In return, they get what he called political resources. Regulators want money and they want votes and they want to stay in office, as I'm sure I don't have to preach here. So, what we have is we have a demand and supply for regulation. And that means that, in the end, we're going to end up with incumbents. And the, I hope what you're all thinking of is the taxi industry at the moment. What we've got is we've got this massive incumbent and it's really hard to break up. And it's hard to break up because the regulators they're getting benefits from it on that side as well. The industry is getting benefits. <coughs> and basically any new technology that comes in, any new, anyone that's trying to break up that industry and change it, they have to put on the table and they have to say, I have more money and I have more votes than you. How about you think about this little relationship and break it up? That's the way I like to think of it. But what Uber's done, and it's partially to do with this whole you can succeed from the state because of all this extra information we have, is Uber's just ignored the rules, what James C. Scott called Irish democracy, you just ignore the rules. <laughs> and what they've done is they've gone to the market and they've got millions of users and they've got a valuation of billions of dollars. And now what we have, which is very, very exciting for the Liberty Movement, is we have the ability to break up this relationship. If Uber hadn't gone and done that, we would still have that same incumbent relationship that's sitting there. Obviously, there's a lot more complexities than this, but that's the way I like to think about it. Uh, the problem is, what's going to happen, what we've started to see in the US, is Uber wants ride-sharing regulations. They want an act. Okay? So now they want some rules. And you can basically think of that as saying, okay, so we think we've got enough money in votes and we're not going to get kicked out anymore. Well, we're still <coughs> legal in most states. but. Maybe we should get some of these barriers too. Right? So this is a problem. And, they're, and obviously they're going to turn into the incumbents in some sense and they're going to block all the next ride sharing, whatever the next thing is, probably driverless cars between Google and Uber, this war that people are talking about um, that may or may not be true. And, but the point is that if this process moves faster, that's a good thing. If we can but what technology is helping us to do is destroy those incumbents quicker. And yes, the entrants will eventually probably turn into the incumbents. We all hope that there is no rules crafted around it at all, but it, it probably will happen. So I'm going to leave on that positive note that 
this, this, this is an optimistic thing, and this is the way we should be talking about technology, is that this is helping us to break up the incumbents that we already have. Um, and I, I might leave it at that, and we'll have some discussion. Mm -hmm. right, right.